Okay, so today I'm going to be talking about why time series data is both the worst and the best use case in distributed databases. Before I like get into the content, let me define what I'm talking about when I talk about time series data, because different people have different expectations of what that means. So a classic example is, you know, stock trades and quotes from finance. Here's one that's near and dear to everybody's heart in this theater. Metrics from DevOps, you know, things coming off your servers, your applications. User analytics is another example. Raw event streams like this log file. You have tons of time series in here. 200 responses over time, 401s, 200s on specific URLs. And this is another one that's coming up a lot more frequently lately, which is sensor data. So when I look at time series data, I have two different ways of looking at it. It's two different kinds of data. The first is what most people think about when they think about time series. It's regular time series data. You see you have samples at regular intervals of time, right? Once every 10 seconds, once a minute. But also for us, we're concerned about irregular time series data. So that's event-driven data that happens either infrequently or sometimes very frequently. But you don't have a regular sampling interval. Now the thing about irregular time series is that you can actually induce a regular time series from a raw event stream. So in this example, we're inducing a count in one minute increments for an hour for each individual customer. So that means for each customer ID that we have, we'll get a regular time series with 60 samples back. But the point about all this is, this is data where the important questions you ask are questions you ask over time. What did things look like for an hour, or for a day, or months? So, <laughs> time series data often makes me feel like this. <laughs> Uh, and there's two parts to this. The first part is the database piece. And then the second part is distributed systems. I separate those out because time series data is horrible for these two different pieces for different reasons. So here's why time series data is really sucky for, for databases. First is high write throughput. Taking an example from DevOps, say you have 2,000 servers or VMs or containers, and you have 200 measurements that you're taking, and you're taking those measurements once every 10 seconds. Over the course of a day, that's about 3.5 billion unique data points that you're pulling in. So in databases, they have, they've, we actually have something where we can say, oh, it's actually optimized for writes. This is a log structured merge tree. This is the underlying uh, storage engine behind Cassandra, Bigtable, React has it as a storage engine option. Uh, and it's great, it's great for writes. It's great for writes in a random key space. But the problem with time series data is that it's even higher write through, read throughput than it is write throughput. So when you're reading data, aggregation and downsampling, so say you want to generate summaries of the data you have, each of those is reading data, right? You have queries for your dashboards. So every user who has a dashboard up is doing a read against your raw data. And finally, you have queries for monitoring systems. And all of that means that you're doing actually more reads than you are writes against the system. So LSM trees stop being a perfect solution because they're optimized for writes, not for reads. So another storage engine technology in databases is what's called a copy on write B plus tree. This is what Mongo used for, for years. Now they have other storage options available, but still, they use this, and it's great because it's optimized for reads. You can get really good performance out of it. But the problem is your write throughput goes to hell. It's absolutely horrible. And the other problem is that there's no compression. And we've already said we're generating a huge amount of data every single day, so compression actually becomes an important thing to look at. So the last reason why time series data sucks for databases is that it's very common to do very large scale deletes of data. Not like individual records, but huge chunks of your data you're deleting. This comes out of the fact that a common use case is to have high precision data that you keep around for, say, a few hours or a few days, and you aggregate and downsample that data so that you keep only the summaries around. Functionally, what that means is if you're clearing out data on a point-by-point -point basis, 
the number of deletes in your system is exactly equal to the number of writes, which is totally insane for any database use case. So looking at LSM trees, deletes are wildly expensive. A delete is actually more expensive than a write because you end up writing a tombstone record, which then slows down your query performance because when you do reads, you have to resolve the tombstones with the records that shouldn't be there. And then later, you run a compaction, which takes an immutable file and it, it rewrites the entire thing without the tombstone records. Copy on write B plus trees, deletes aren't expensive on themselves, but if you want to reclaim the disk space, they're expensive. So the result of this is there's really no perfect storage engine for these access properties. Time series data in databases <laughs> is really horrible. Um, okay, so now I can talk about distributed systems. Why, why is time series data so painful for distributed systems? The first is this, range scans of many keys, right? So in InfluxDB, the way we organize your time series data is we have a measurement. In this case, we have like a measurement called CPU. And then we have a set of tags that describe the metadata around the measurements you're taking. So here, the tags are key value pairs, and we see region is US West, host is server A. An individual key would be all that information plus a timestamp. So that's an actual individual data point. So a common query that you would do is say, select the max value from CPU for the last six hours in five minute windows of time. Now notice from this query that we're getting all the hosts from the US West merged into one series. So we're range scanning over a lot of data. And the question in a distributed system is, how do we distribute the data? How do we know what servers the data should go to? Should we do it by measurement? We can say, okay, everything for CPU goes to this server. And the problem is then you've created a bottleneck for both writes and reads. So now we say, okay, well maybe we can do it by measurement plus the tags. And the problem there is that your series grows indefinitely. Now, for lower, for time series that are regular that aren't sampled very frequently, it's not as big of a problem. For event-driven time series, it becomes a big problem if you have all of the data for the series for all time going to a single server. It's a read bottleneck on queries, and it's a problem when you want to move the data around in a cluster. So finally, we can say, oh, well, what about if we just do by everything, by all the data for the key, the measurement, the tags, and the exact timestamp? And we'll, just figure, we'll distribute all those keys randomly in the cluster. Then the problem is, like, what keys exist? We don't have strictly regular time series, so we don't know for a fact that at this timestamp, we should have a data point. So we have no idea of how to reconcile that, how to figure that out. And then the other part is you don't get data locality around the queries. I'll talk a little bit more about this later. So this is the other thing that is painful about time series data and distributed systems, which is high throughput. So I'm not gonna talk too much about the CAP theorem. There are other speakers who are giving talks today that uh, can speak much more intelligently about it. But there is something that's important about the CAP theorem that has, has an effect on us. So really quickly, the CAP theorem, it's three different pieces. The first is consistency, which is when you're doing reads in a cluster, you get a consistent view of the data no matter what server you hit. The other is availability. When I make requests to either read or write data, I always get a successful response. And P is the important part, which is what kind of guarantees can you make around consistency and availability in the face of partitions? Now, I didn't really say network partitions, because for me, a partition can happen even if you have network hardware that has 100% uptime. But the point is you can either pick C or A. You can't pick both. P is happening whether you have perfect network hardware or not. And the important thing for us about P is that pauses under load look like network partitions. They look like a process that's not responding. Is it not responding because the network's down? Or is it not responding because it's doing a garbage collection? Or it has a query that hit the box that's just crushing it? So for us, high throughput equals load, which equals network partitions. So those happen all the time. And then the other hard part about this is, if, you, if we wanted to create a CP system for time series, what would that look like? 
how would we guarantee consistency under high write throughput? Time series queries do range scans over recent data that's always moving. With sensor data, sometimes you have sensors that sample multiple times per second. With event streams, it can be even worse, right? So what does a consistent view of this data look like? What will we have to do to guarantee consistency? Stop everything at a point in time and say, okay, nobody can write data here so that we can answer this query? Honestly, like, sometimes it makes me think I should just quit software development, maybe try becoming an actor, who knows? <laughs> uh, yeah, time series database and data and distributed systems makes me very sad. But it's not all bad news. Time series data also has some great properties for databases. This is a big one, no updates. You're talking about a workload that's always append and insert. It's always new data. It's either new data that's very recent or it's historical backfill, but again, you're talking about new data. You have large ranges of the key space that are potentially cold for writes. You're only reading data out of those. So we can use those properties to create immutable data structures and files. So in that sense, it's kind of like an LSM tree, but we want something that's a bit more specific. And the other weird thing is that deletes that happen, again, aren't usually against single records. They're against large ranges of old data. You say, drop three month old data from every series because I don't need it around anymore. I've already downsampled it. I've already captured the summaries, right? So for us, what we do with InfluxDB is we partition the data by ranges of time. For example, all data for a day goes here, or all data for an hour goes here. And then when we want to delete old data, we just drop the files, right? This is why deletes can be potentially expensive in, in other data structures, is you have to update indexes and all this other stuff. Dropping files is really cheap. And for deletes that have to hit a specific record, we can just tombstone the one-offs and then resolve that later. All of that for us is pointing to creating a new storage engine that's optimized for our use case. At the moment we don't have that, but we're going to be doing that work later this year. So the other thing is we have great properties for distributed systems. Again, no updates. No updates is huge. No updates means no contention. Large scale deletes on cold areas of the key space. The cold areas of the key space are cold for both reads and writes. If you're deleting data that you're no longer querying against, it's easier to, to do that. Both of these things make it perfect for an AP system, right, where we're optimized around availability when partitions happen, and we can do eventual consistency. Like I said, conflict resolution is easier here. No updates means no contention. We partition the key space by ranges of time. So that is, we partition it into old data versus new data. That way we can perform operations on the old data and not have to worry about tons of writes coming into that same area. Old data doesn't change in the time series use case. And the consistent view on new data is really just the union of the servers that you hit. If two servers respond and one knows about a data point that the other one doesn't, we know that the consistent view is just the union of the data they both have. And deletes against ranges that are cold for writes and queries means we don't have to worry as much about contention in that area of the key space. Another interesting one is when you expand your cluster to increase your storage capacity, it doesn't necessarily require that you rebalance it, right? Like normal consistent hashing schemes, you add servers to your cluster and you have to rebalance portions of the key space. For us, if you're adding servers to your cluster for more storage, we just have the new data grow into the servers that you've added, whereas the old servers are still hot for queries. So the final bit I wanted to talk about was data locality. That is, how we ship the code to where the data lives and not the other way around, right? That's distributed computing and MapReduce, what they taught us. So the first thing is, we evenly distribute the data across the cluster per day. Say per day is our scheme. So here we have four separate unique series, and we see that two of those are going into one shard, and two of those are going into another shard. Each shard lives on a server, and whatever the number of replicas are that has it. 
So for example, this query right here, where I have the relevant bits highlighted in red, we know the measurement is CPU, and we know the, the tag information, and we know the time. So we can hit a single shard to answer that query. Now here's a more complicated query that will actually have to merge series together. We have CPU and we have one tag, but only US West. So that means we have to merge all the hosts from, one, from the US West region into one series. So we have to hit many shards. And what we do behind the scenes is we decompose this as a MapReduce job that we run on the fly. So here we have mean was the aggregate function that we're computing. So we have a map job for mean. And we just compute the count and the running mean. And then we return that. Then we reduce that all on one server. So basically, the server that gets the query to begin with is the one that runs the reducer. It sends the stuff all out to the mappers, which send the data back. The important piece of this is that we only transmit the summary ticks across the cluster. So for that query, where we're grouping by time of five minutes, we're only sending a single tick per five minute window per server. Ultimately, there will be more that we add. Time series data has really odd workloads when it comes to distributed databases. High re read and write throughput, append and insert only, which is really strange, and really large deletes. All of those things conspire to make it actually horrible and great to work with at the same time on distributed databases. Thank you. <laughs>